Hello and welcome to Gamers Tavern Reviews. We're looking at the Shadowrun 6th World Beginner Box from Catalyst Game Labs, which was provided to us by the publisher to review. This is our first taste of the new Shadowrun 6th edition, so let's take a look at what changes they've made to the system. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the components of the beginner's box because I did do an unboxing video, which you can find a link to in the notes. Uh, even after spending about a week with the set, I really don't have that much to add. Uh, you get two 24 page booklets, one the quick start rules and one the adventure battle royale. Uh, there's 12 custom shatter and dice made to be easy to use with the game's fixed target number dice pull system, a deck of reference cards for gear, spells, vehicles, and NPCs. There's a poster with one side having the two maps from the adventure, and the other side being the City of Seattle in 2080, the game's default setting. You've got four character dossiers, one for each of the pregens, with character sheets, background info, and role-playing tips for each. And finally, there's a very, very, very brief overview of what the Shadowrun world is and a one-page timeline of events. Considering I'm still working on that Sixth World History video I promised back in March, and I ended up splitting that video in two, and the first part is going to be at least an hour long. Yeah, a one-page timeline doesn't really do much to catch you up on all the events that changed in the world, but it does manage to get the biggest stuff out there for brand new players. And yes, everything has the purple-pink-blue bisexual color scheme that you see in some of the images. It's dominant in all the art and the layout across the entire beginner box down to the dice. But I know what you're here for, and it's the rules. What's the same, what's changed, and what's new? Task resolution is the same it's been for the previous two editions. You make a pull of six-sided dice, usually out of the combination of an attribute and a skill. You roll them, and any fives or sixes are hits. You either want to get more hits than the threshold for the test, or more than the other side did on an opposed test. If half or more of the dice pull comes up as ones, you glitch and something bad happens even if you succeeded on the roll. The different starting species all get their own descriptions and I love them. I love them so much. I can't figure out any way to top what was written in the book, so I'm just going to read them out straight, though the order is different than what's printed in the books. Dwarfs, known for short size, stocky builds, perseverance. Orcs, known for big, powerful physique, tusks, constantly being seen as outsiders. Elves, known for slender, lithe builds, being attractive and knowing it. Trolls, known for being so big, you guys, just huge, and horns. Humans, known for average size, average build, and freaking out about people who don't meet their averages. I mean... It's 2019, you kind of have to put this sort of description in a book for new players, but I mean, we're living in a world where Lord of the Rings won Academy Awards and a D&D &D cartoon based off a live stream kickstarted for eight figures. People know this, Drake, but you kind of have to include it, so have a bit of fun with it. Attributes are the same from the last two editions. Body, agility, reaction, strength, willpower, logic, intuition, and charisma. You've also got special attributes, essence, and edge, and some characters will have a third special attribute, like magically active characters will have magic. Now, there is no mention of Technomancers anywhere in the quick start, so I have no clue about them or Resonance, so we'll have to wait for the core rulebook for that, it seems. So the biggest change from 5th edition is that limits are gone! Now, I did praise this mechanic back when 5th edition first came out because it felt like the first real attempt to put a cap on the ever-increasing dice pulls of Shadowrun, where in 4th edition you could have characters brand new out of character creation rolling 30 or more dice, and it made every attribute important in some way. But after playing for a while, I really came to hate limits, because it managed to suck a lot of the fun out of a good roll. You'd look down and just be so happy at all the fives and sixes you rolled, and then realized your limit was three, so the other six hits you got just vanished. Well, no more of that. The Be Awesome tax has been repealed. The biggest new addition, though, is the Edge system, which has become pretty core to how the game functions. I'll go into more detail about that in a bit, but I really do like this. It feels very Shadowrun, and it adds a lot to the game. But first, so we can see how Edge works in context, let's talk a bit about combat. It starts with everyone rolling initiative, and like usual, there's an initiative rating plus a number of, of initiative dice. 
uh, which is pretty much still the only place in Shadowrun where you actually count the numbers on the dice in the core roll system. So you roll your initiative dice and add it to your initiative rating and that's your initiative score. Once you've rolled it once, that's it. That's the order of combat. Start with the highest number, everyone takes their turn, and then you start over again at the top. And I can tell right now the audience is kind of split in two right now between the Shadowrun players freaking out and the non-Shadowrun players wondering what the big deal is. For the second group of people, Shadowrun Initiative has always been a little bit different. You would roll your initiative and take your action, and then subtract 10 from your initiative score. If your initiative was still greater than zero, you got to act again before the round was over. This led to characters with a bunch of initiative enhancements getting three or four turns every combat round, while the people without those enhancements would just be sitting around waiting for the street samurai or physical adept to clear the field. The new system does bring initiative closer to what other games use because now you just get one turn per round. Now for all you Shadowrun players freaking out because your Wired Reflex 3 plus Reaction Enhancer 10 characters won't be fun anymore, don't worry. The game has you taken care of with the new action economy. Every character gets one major action and one minor action on their turn, plus one additional minor action for each initiative die they have. Since everyone's got 1d6 as the base initiative die, that means everyone's going to have one major action and at least two minor actions. But faster characters get more, so if you've got, say, 3d6 initiative dice, you get one major action and four minor actions. Now that number is significant because that's the break for trading. You can trade four minor actions for one major action. So even though you're not getting several turns every round anymore, it doesn't mean you're not getting some badass bonuses thanks to your speed. Minor actions include stuff like turning on or off astral perception, reloading a smart gun, standing up, taking cover, moving, falling prone, and veteran Shadowrun players had the red root scratch moment when I said moving. Yes, movement is now integrated into the main action economy. For one of your minor actions, you take the move action and you move 10 meters. That's it. There's no more calculating movement speeds to divide it across an entire combat round or any of that stuff. It's just use the minor action, move, and you move 10 meters. Simple. If you want to move more than that, there is a sprint action, but that's now a major action. You move 15 meters plus one meter for every hit on an agility plus athletics test. Now, the trick is you can only take one movement action per turn, so no doubling up by taking more than one move action or a move and then a sprint. I mean, there's only so far you can physically move in three seconds after all. Major actions are typically what you'd expect, but there are a couple of surprises. There's attack, cast spell, use skill, reload a non-smart gun weapon, and so on. The big one that will trip up some people, though, is ready weapon is now a major action. That means if when the balloon goes up and combat starts, you don't have your gun out already, you're not going to be able to attack the first round of combat. Which actually makes surprise an even bigger advantage because if a target is surprised, they can't act in the first round at all. If you manage to set up an ambush for the corpse sec guards, you're going to get two rounds to take them out before they get a chance to fire back. So let's talk about the actual attack action itself. And this is where we're going to start digging deep into the edge system. Now, I want to point out, I'm using combat to demonstrate the edge system because it's kind of the most clear example of how it works in this beginner box. But the edge system works in any sort of conflict, not just combat. So negotiations, trying to fast talk your way past a guard, hacking computer system, a chase scene. These are all conflicts that will take advantage of the edge system. Now, my only real complaint about the edge system is it revolves around three terms, all of which have the word edge in it, but do different things, which makes it a little bit harder to explain. So um, I've kind of drawn some visuals here. S forgive my lack of art ability, but hopefully it'll help you follow along here. Your edge attribute is one of your special attributes. At the start of each session, you get a number of edge points equal to your edge attribute that are added to your edge pool. See what I mean? So anyway, your edge pool is a pool of points of edge you can spend once per action taken to alter the encounter in your favor. That still sounds more complicated than it actually is. Your pool is how many points you have to spend to get edge effects on dice rolls for an action. Okay, hopefully one of those explanations made sense. But anyway, once you parse how the system works, it's really simple to use. 
There's a list of different things you can do with edge, each with a different point cost. For example, if you spend one edge, you can reroll one die. If you spend two edge, you can give a point of edge to an ally or take one point of edge away from an enemy. For three edge, you can buy an automatic hit on a test. For four, you can reroll all of your failed dice. And for five, you can force your opponent to count ones and twos in determining if they have a glitch, or you can actually create some sort of special circumstance with GM approval. That last one gives a lot of flexibility, but it could be something like um, a night errand patrol happens to wander by, or a brownout turns out all the lights on the block. Now, there's a couple of tricks to how you can spend edge, since some of the effects are available only when you roll and some of them only after. Either way, you can only spend edge once per action. However, you can spend more than one point of edge on the same effect. So remember how I said it costs one point to reroll one die? You can spend three edge and reroll three dice, but you can't do that and buy an automatic hit. Next, your edge pull has a limit of seven maximum, so you can't stockpile a whole bunch of edge. And that's particularly true because of this final bit. At the end of the encounter, any edge in your edge pull higher than your edge attribute is lost. So you've got to use it or you're going to lose it. So how do you actually get edge? That leads directly into how combat works. Because the first step of resolving an attack is determining who, if anyone, gets any edge. There's three different ways for one side of the combat to get edge. First, you compare the attacker's attack value to the target's defense value. If the attack value is four or more higher, the attack gets one edge. And um, attack value is determined by your weapon and what range you're at, while your defense value comes from your armor and any cover you have. Oh, and a uh, range is now set to close, near, medium, far, and extreme, and it's the same range distance for every weapon. It, it doesn't change by weapon anymore. Every weapon just has those range, just some of them you can't fire at extreme or far distances. And uh, the attack value varies for some weapons, so some of them are unusable at some ranges, and some of them are more powerful at certain ranges. Anyway, the second way to get edge is through a circumstantial advantage. Uh, if one side has a strong tactical advantage over the other, they get a point of edge. There's only one edge available here, so only one side gets it, and it's possible for neither side to get it. An example of advantage would be if the attacker has low light vision or thermographic vision, and the target doesn't, and you're in a dark environment. Or if the attacker has their AR turned on in a spam zone and the defender doesn't, so the attacker is just distracted by all the blaring nerps and taco temple advertisements. The final way to get edge is if you have any specific gear that gives you a point of edge. I really can't elaborate any more on that one because there's no examples of it in the beginner box. So I don't know how that works specifically. Even without that, the first two methods are enough to get my approval on this system. The reason why is that every time, in every edition, it has been like pulling teeth to get my players to use cover. This may not seem like much, but like I said, you get an edge for having an attack value four or more higher than your defense value. Most characters are going to have a defense value of around four to six to eight at least based on the pregens, and weapons tend to have attack values ranging from 8 to 12, depending on the range. So cover is going to be the defining difference, as even one quarter cover is worth plus two to your defense value. Also, jockeying for range is going to count for that as well, trying to keep a target in the preferred range for your weapon, because being just one range increment off can drastically throw off your attack value. So this is going to mean a lot more tactical movement in the game as people are kind of jogging around for position. Now, the second way of getting edge also adds a lot of cinematic fun to the combat as this is where players can get creative with movement and terrain. Anything they can think of to get that momentary edge, no pun intended, over their opponent. This is where you get your John Woo gun caught at a bounce all over the terrain, leaping over tables and diving behind desks. Or you can actually just use real tactics like considered movement, cover, choosing your moment to shoot. I I'm really impressed with how much this adds to things and how much it also streamlines the old, okay, you get plus two for your smart link, but minus two for the target's cover, but plus one because you got low light, but minus two for range, plus one for vision magnification, but minus two for the smoke, but... Those could rack up quickly in previous editions and made a lot more math, and it slowed things down.
So now that we've got Edge pretty much sorted, let's go on to the attack itself. The attacker rolls their attack, which is typically agility plus a combat skill, like firearms or close quarters combat. Oh yeah, the skill system has gotten streamlined a lot, so what used to be skill groups are now just skills on their own. But we don't get the full skill list in the beginner box, which is why this is kind of an afterthought shoved in here as opposed to a whole section on its own. Anyway, the defender rolls a dodge attempt of intuition plus reaction. If the defender gets more hits, the attack misses. If the attacker gets more, it hits. Ties go to the attacker, not the defender. So if the attack hits, you take the total number of hits the attacker got more than the defender, add that to the base damage of the weapon, and that's the damage the target has to try to soak. Soak rolls are made just with the body attribute, and each hit reduces the damage by one. The base damage for most weapons starts at three, and the highest body rating of any character in the quick start is just seven, with the majority more in the three to five range. So yes, this means characters are going to take a lot more damage, most likely. Oh, and remember how I said that edge can only be spent once per action? That goes both ways. So even though the defenders are making two rolls, the dodge roll and the soak roll, they can only use edge on one of those two rolls. Oh, and uh, just as a side note, I posted a more straightforward review on Ian World. Uh, there is a link to that in the show notes as well. And several people seem to think this combat system is more complicated uh, than something like Dungeons and Dragons, since it requires three rolls compared to just one for D&D. Well, first off, it's two rolls for D&D, the attack and the damage. Second, um, do you know the rule about take 10 for D&D? Uh, that's where you assume you rolled a 10 for a die roll and you add your bonus to speed things up. How do you determine your AC again? Isn't it 10 plus the armor modifiers? So the only difference between the two is they don't have defense rolls, even though the system does support it. It's been an optional role since 3rd edition and it's mandatory for some D20 system derivatives like Hackmaster. Using the optional rules, it's the same process. Does one side have an advantage on the attack? They get advantage. Each side rolls their attack and defense rolls. If the defense wins, the attack misses. If the attacker wins or there's a tie, the attack hits. If the attack hits, you roll dice to determine how much damage the target ends up taking. So, <laughs> Fire rates have changed a lot in this edition too, and yes, this change is going to also make combat deadlier. There's no more figuring out recoil or counting multiple rounds, as it now just shifts from the attack value to the damage. Single shot is the default value for a firearm. Semi-auto lets you fire two rounds for minus two attack rating and plus one damage. Burst fire is minus four attack rating for plus two damage, or you can split between two targets as if you used a semi-auto attack on each. Now, the quick start doesn't have anything about full auto rules, so those may be a little bit more complicated. So healing has shed a lot of the weird rules it used to have as well. It doesn't matter anymore what order you apply healing in because magic and traditional medicine just work the same. So you won't lock yourself out of magical healing just because your buddy with the med kit got to you first. What does matter though is timing. Magical healing doesn't have a time limit, but you can only be healed by magic four times per day and only once for each set of injuries. Of course, if you're getting seriously injured five times a day, I don't think Shadowrun is quite the career for you. First aid can be applied at any time within one minute from the end of a combat encounter. Afterwards, you're stuck. This has the same limit of only applying first aid up to four times per day and once per set of injuries, though this is tracked separately from magical healing. Med kits work identical to first aid, except you have up to one hour after the end of combat. Now, one place the quick start rules isn't clear, though, is whether or not you can get treatment from first aid and from a med kit. However, you can definitely get magical healing and some form of mundane medical care. The quick start also doesn't have rules for natural healing, but you can get a bit of healing done within an encounter, too. Uh, it costs three edge to heal one box of stun damage and four edge to heal one box of physical damage. So what about death? Well, each character has a damage tracker with a number of, for lack of a better word, I'm going to call them hit points. For every three hit points of damage a character takes, they get a cumulative minus one die to all tests they make. When you run out of hit points, you fall unconscious and go into overflow. Each character has an overflow equal to twice their body attribute. 
Once you hit that, you are D-E-D dead. If there is an equivalent of the Hand of God in this edition that's kind of a one-off, get-out-of-death-free card in 6th edition, it's not in the quick start. So that should take care of combat for the most part. So let's talk about rules for some of the most popular and most problem-causing builds in Shadowrun, starting with the big one, decking. I'm going to be up front. Decking has never really confused me. Not the first or second edition dungeon crawl decking, not the second or third edition security sheaf, and not the fourth edition hacking or fifth edition grid overwatch version. I've never really gotten how this confuses people so much, so just keep that in mind when I say that decking in 6th edition comes across as incredibly simplified from previous editions, and in my opinion, possibly too much. If this is all decking is, I would be disappointed in how much it's been dumbed down. However, it's strongly hinted in the quick start that this is just a limited version of decking, and the core rules will have more options. Basically, this presents the single set of options for how to use decking, like just using the brute force method from 5th edition, and there's a whole nother set of options that you can mix and match in the core rules. Anyway, if I think the quick start rules are too simple, that might be an indication that it's the right mix for everyone else. Comlinks are still in the game, they're basically like cell phones with augmented reality interfaces instead of touch screens, and they have two attributes, data processing and firewall. Cyberdex have changed a lot in how they look from portable keyboards like screenless laptops to medieval looking gauntlets? Dex have two additional attributes, attack and sleaze. Attack and sleaze are generally used for offensive tasks, while data processing and firewall are used for defense. Specifically, those attributes added together make the attack value and defense value of a deck. So you can see decking mechanics pretty much line up with a lot of the other mechanics in several ways. Now, in addition to the major and minor actions, all actions in the matrix are split into two categories, legal and illegal. There's a list of 12 total actions you can take, and each one is clearly labeled as legal or illegal, so there's no guessing there. Now, it's not clear if that means legal or illegal by the permissions you have within a specific host you're on, or if it's more of a against the law illegal. But anyway, legal actions use logic and electronics for your dice pool, while any illegal actions are logic plus cracking. And yes, this is another example of the streamlining of the skill system. The list of matrix actions are pretty clear as to what they do from just the names, which helps a lot, though knowing a little bit about computers or networking might help in that regard. Uh, Specifically, a host is any system that you can get access to, whether it's a massive corporate server or just someone's comm link. Now, the legal actions start with into or exit host, which may not seem like it should be legal, but, well, basically... You can log on, doesn't mean you have access to anything. It's like pulling up a website. Sure, you can do that, but you may not have access to anything without a username and password to log in. Next up is edit file, which is editing any file you have access to. Matrix perception is examining or searching for a file, device, or a linked host, or noticing any sort of information about what's around you in the host. Format device lets you tell any device that the next time it reboots, it just shuts off instead and basically cuts itself off from the matrix. You can still pull the trigger on a gun or turn the handle on a door, but any sort of matrix interaction like a smart gun feature or an alarm won't work anymore. Finally, there's jack out, which is just completely logging off the matrix altogether. Illegal actions, also known as the fun stuff, are hack, which is how you gain control over a device. Uh, If you have a device that you don't have access to, you get access. If you hack a device that you have access to, you gain total control over the device. For those with a little bit of computer experience, it's kind of the difference between like a user level account or a root or admin access or jailbreaking it. Snoop lets you intercept matrix traffic, whether it's phone calls, video feeds, processing data, or anything else. You can record the data that you intercept as well. Spoof has you faking having owner access to a device to perform just a single command. Trace Icon gives you either the source matrix location of anything on the matrix. So if you run into another decker, you can find out where they are physically, or you can trace a bot back to its home server. Control Device lets you take control of any device on a network in a sustained way. Crack File gives you edit access to a file and is required before you can take the legal action edit file if you don't already have permission. 
Finally, data spike is a direct attack against any device or another user sending harmful code at them as a matrix attack. So what's the consequence of illegal actions? Well, every attempt is opposed against the post stats and every single hit, not just net hits, every hit rolled is counted towards your Overwatch score. Yes, Grid Overwatch Division is still around, and they've gotten even worse in 6th edition. If your Overwatch score hits 40, Convergence. No chance to escape, no chance to jack out, no chance to fight back, your deck is bricked, you're dumped out of the Matrix, and your physical location is reported to whatever law enforcement the god thinks should know. Yeah, that kinda sucks. On the plus side, though, the quick start rules don't have an action to check your Overwatch score, so it seems like this is just something you're aware of, so it's your own fault if you fly too close to the sun. Now, there's also three programs you can get to assist you in various illegal actions. Decrypt gives you a plus two to the crack file action, Exploit reduces a target's defense by two, and Overclock gives you two extra dice to any action but it makes the action taken illegal, even if it was a legal action. Also, any of these programs automatically increase your Overwatch score by one just by using them. Rigging has to be the most complicated system in the quick start, but again, this may be the opposite of decking for me personally. I've never really grokked the rigging rules in any edition. I've never actually played a rigger, even in the video games. And while I think these rules are easy to follow, they still seem a little bit complicated. But people who play riggers may look at these and think they're too simplified the same way I look at decking. To start, a lot like how it feels like we're missing at least half the decking rules, the same's going on here. There's a lot of focus on vehicles and not so much on drones. One thing I didn't mention in the decking section is the difference between AR and VR. Augmented reality, your stats are normal, but in virtual reality, your body goes limp and you're fully in the matrix. Jumping in does the same thing in rigging, and the advantage for both cases is that you use only your mental attributes for all tests. Any test that requires using your body, agility, reaction, or strength uses your willpower, logic, intuition, or charisma, respectively. Handling tests are handled no pun intended, again, by a reaction plus piloting test. And the threshold for that test is the vehicle's handling rating. Each vehicle also has a different handling, whether they're on-road or off-road. It's also affected by the vehicle's speed, which... This is what I mean about it being the most complicated mechanic in the quick start. Your vehicle starts with a speed of zero. Every turn, you can increase the speed up to the vehicle's acceleration rating. Every time the vehicle's speed hits a speed interval, each handling test is done at minus one die for the test. Each vehicle also has a top speed that it can't go past. Did you follow all that? I hope so, because I'm not explaining it again or giving an example, because that's a lot of math and this review is too damn long already. So if you fail the handling test, there is a chance of crashing. The crash test is piloting plus reaction, but... I couldn't find what the threshold was for the test, and but if you fail, everyone in the vehicle takes damage equal to one-tenth the vehicle's current speed, mitigated by any safety features in the vehicle. And the quick start doesn't really talk about any of those safety features, so it's unclear exactly what they do. For drone rigging, it feels like two systems, one for remote controlling and one for being jumped in. And neither is really flushed out all that much. Um, attacks are done by sensor plus sensor by remote control, but it's logic plus engineering if you're jumped in. The drone initiative is pilot plus pilot, or the riggers initiative if they're jumped in. There's also the odd limit that drones can only have one weapon so long as it's smaller than the drone itself, but it can hold a maximum of 250 rounds regardless of the size. I really think this was stripped down to its bare bones. On second thought, I'm not sure the rigging rules are actually that complicated, as they're just confusing the way they're presented. I think the rules will probably make more sense if they're fleshed out more, but at the same time, there's really no reason to in the quick start. None of the characters are riggers, and there's no rigging in the included adventure. I'm not really sure why the rules were included in the first place, other than a lot of people would be upset if 
there wasn't even a hint of it because I know I would be if they'd left out decking. So that covers the cyberpunk. But what about the fantasy? Magic has also undergone a pretty big overhaul, and like with the others, it's for simplification. Skills are reduced, and the process cut down greatly by the removal of force. Yes, force is gone. There is no more force rating for spells. This is a big change as force ratings has been part of the game since first edition. Spellcasting is a pretty simple process. First, you determine if you want to adjust the spell, which this is the mechanic that replaces force. Some spells can be enhanced at the cost of more drain, particularly combat spells where you get one more damage for each two drain. Then you roll a magic plus a sorcery test and you soak the drain using magic plus an attribute determined by your tradition. In the quick start, they list mages using logic and shaman using charisma. And for those who want to use other traditions right away and just can't wait, that should give you an idea of how to temporarily adapt them. There's nothing in the quick start rules about summoning spirits, so I have no idea how that's going to work in the core rules yet. However, counterspelling and dispelling are in here, and it's way easier and much more useful than it used to be. Counterspelling doesn't require you to pick a target, it just works for everyone within two meters of you. It's a major action, but it lasts for your magic rating in turns. You make a magic plus sorcery test, and the number of hits are added to the dice pool for any spell defense for anyone within two meters of you. Dispelling is also pretty easy. It's just an opposed magic plus sorcery test against double the drain value of the spell. And it's cumulative, so each hit you get on the tests reduce the number of hits on the spell on a one-for-one -one basis until it's finally ended. The only other information on magic is a large amount on object resistance, which honestly is something that's never really come up in any other game I've played in other editions, so I'm not sure why there's so much detail on it here, but there's also a bit about astral perception and astral projection. Not a whole lot, just the basic descriptions, which is a shame because new players are probably going to skim right over that. By the way, all the rules I've talked about so far are in the quick start rules, which makes up about 20 pages. The last four pages of the quick start, there's three pages of reference tables, and the last page is stat blocks for the four pre-generated characters, so game masters can reference them quickly without taking the player's character sheets, which is a nice addition. However, the quick start rules are just the rules. There is no gear, no spells, no nothing in the quick start. All of that information is either on the character sheets or on the equipment cards, which I'll talk about those in a little bit later. Before we look at the rest of the box, I'm going to do a little bit of extrapolation and speculation based on what's included with the rules, what's alluded to, and what's specifically not mentioned. If you're watching this in August, after the full rules have come out, feel free to mock me for everything I got wrong. Or if you're one of the Catalyst freelancers, or if you're one of the Shadowcast members who have access to the rules already, you can mock me too. Anyway, qualities are definitely in the game. All of the pregens have at least one, but there are no rules included whatsoever. I assume they're included in the calculations for different stats and dice pools, but the only mention for qualities in the entire rulebook is that they're going to be in the core rulebook, but for now, just use them for roleplay purposes. Now, Zipfile, the Decker character, has a deck that has eight slots on it. There's no indication of what those slots are for. I mean, are they expansions for add-ons, or are they slots for programs? I mean, there's only three programs in the quick start, so that must mean there's more programs in the core game. Either way, this does back up the idea that the decking rules have been hacked, no pun intended, again, down to the bare minimum for the quick start, so I should get the depth that I want from the full version. There's also a spot on the sheets for Matrix Initiative and Astral Initiative, but there's no actual stats on that line for either the Mage Frostburn or the Decker Zip Files character sheets. So I've got no idea how that works or how those scores will change. This is particularly interesting considering the new action economy where initiative dice give you extra actions. So that's something else to keep an eye on when the core rulebook drops. Several of the derived attributes have survived this edition, like Composure, Judge, Intentions, and Memory. There's no indication of how they're calculated, and there's no indication of how they're actually used. They're just on the character sheet. Zipfile has a piece of cyborg called a Cyberjack. Hers is a rating 4, and it lists stats of 7 slash 6. I have no idea what those stats mean. 
but it does also list a matrix initiative of plus two, which that one's a little bit more obvious. But it could mean initiative rating or initiative dice. And again, dice are important in this. But according to an interview with Jason Hardy done by the Arcology podcast, Cyberjacks are a form of advanced data jack that give deckers additional abilities and more defense. But as far as specifics, I got no idea. Finally, the pre-general character Rude is a street samurai, but he only has two pieces of cyberware. I mean, his essence is a 5.6. That's a little bit out of character for the build type, but I'm not entirely sure why. I, I, I don't think anything in the core rulebook is going to enlighten us on that regard, so this is going to be a mystery left to the designers. Speaking of the four pre-generated characters, they actually look pretty good. I've got Frostburn, the Orc Combat Mage, you, the Elf Covert Ops Specialist slash Face, Rude, the Troll Street Samurai, and Zipfile, the Dwarf Decker. While I haven't seen the character generation rules to tell for sure, but these actually look like the least nerfed pregens I've seen in Shadowrun for several editions, if not ever. I mean, usually the pregens are so under-optimized they're next to useless, but all of these characters seem pretty competent in their main area of expertise. Uh, the backstories do seem a little bit generic for Shadowrun, but it's also a beginner box and it's meant for new players who aren't used to the system, so the cliche of a street samurai with amnesia isn't quite as big of a cliche to someone who's first coming to the game. So let's talk about the cards that come with the game. The deck is where you're going to be looking for the stats for everything, as the only thing that has its stats listed anywhere else are the NPCs, the adventure, and some of the stats on the character sheets. I'm not going to list off all the stats or explain what all of these things are. So if you're not a Shadowrun player, this is going to sound like I'm just throwing out a bunch of words at you. But for Shadowrun players, you're going to recognize a lot of these different weapons and other things. So I'm just going to list off what cards are in the deck. For weapons, we have the Walter Palm Pistol, Ares Lightfire 75, the Ares Predator 6, the Browning Ultra Power, Ruger Super Warhawk, the Uzi 5, Ares Desert Eagle, Defiance T250, the Yamaha Pulsar 1, a katana, sword, knife, club, extendable baton, and bike chain. For armor, there's only three options, the armored vest, the armored jacket, and the lined coat. The calm links included are the Sony Emperor, the Rinraku Sensei, the Erika Elite, and the Hermes Icon. The vehicles are the Ford Americar, the Harley Davidson Scorpion, and the Yamaha Rapier. So that would be one boring sedan and two motorcycles. Okay. Anyway, there's two drones, the Steel Lynx and the MCT Nissan Roto Drone. The only cyberdeck included is the Rinraku Kitsune. And there's a few other bits like the three decking programs and a white noise generator. The spells are the biggest section though. We've got Armor, Combat Sense, Detect Life, Flame Strike, Fireball, Heal, Ice Spear, Increase Attribute, Improved Invisibility, Levitate, Mana Barrier, Confusion, Stun Bolt, and Stun Ball. <sighs> There's also a little bit of weirdness on these cards that will probably confuse a lot of new players. The armor spell describes its effects on the card, with a bit about how net hits on the magic plus sorcery test add to the target's defense value and their body value for soaking damage. That part's not the weird part, obviously. The weird part is that that description shows up on both the Flame Strike and the Fireball spell cards as well. I'd say it's just an accidental misprint in my copy since this is a review copy, so it might be like an early proof, but the card's been reproduced in the Quick Start rules, and that text is included on the card that's printed in the rules. So I'm not exactly sure what happened there, but I don't think... The fire-based combat spells are good to increase the target's defense somehow. It, it, it should just set them on fire. So, um... Oh, whoa! There's also a really, really cool poster. Uh, it's one side is Seattle in 2080 with markers for all the important Sixth World locations. And the other has the maps from the adventure... Oh, the dice! Dice! Uh, the dice are pretty cool. Basically, uh, it's the same sort of design if you've seen the collector's dice that Calus has been selling for a while. You get 12 of them, and considering the dice sets tend to be $14 for 6 dice, and the starter set's only $24.95, this is a good deal all on its own, even if it's 2 dice short of the largest dice pull in the... Adventure. 
Ugh, frag, I'm gonna have to talk about Battle Royale, aren't I? <sighs> First off, the adventure is not bad. It's, it's a nice if short adventure. It, it's fine, it's fine. It's, it's fine. It's just a terrible introductory adventure for Shadowrun. The very, very first introductory adventure for Shadowrun going all the way back to first edition is called Food Fight. It's not really an adventure so much as it's just a setup for a combat rolls demo with some fun little twist to it. The runners are in a stuffer shack, which is a convenience store that's something between a cross between 7-Eleven and a Walmart. A bunch of gangers bust in and try to rob the place, and a firefight breaks out sooner rather than later, as the gangers will eventually provoke the party. Uh, there's a cool table that you can roll on for missed shots to show what happened on the store shelves and ended up getting shot in terms of color, consistency, and material. The ganger's shotgun blast goes wide and hits the shelf behind you with jars exploding, covering you in... Red. Chunky. Meat. Battle Royale, the included introductory adventure, starts from there... Kind of. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes of the adventure, but to avoid spoilers, I'm going to explain how this adventure plays out from the player's point of view. The runners are in the stuffer shack when a bunch of racket happens outside. When they try to leave, a few gangers stop them. The scene behind them is a group of four different gangs surrounding a high-priced limo. The runners are warned firmly to go back in the store and mind their own business. So, um... Why, 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 why wouldn't they? I mean, it's put forward that there's a large armed mob out there surrounding a limo that could have anyone inside. I mean, it's obviously someone wealthy. Wealthy usually means corporate, which means they probably deserve whatever's happening to them. Eat the rich. Sorry, got a little carried away there. Basically, there's nothing directly motivating the characters to get involved. I mean, they could hope for a reward from whoever's in the limo, but it's just as likely the occupant could take the assistance for granted because they're just awesome and deserve to be rescued for the good of everyone and I'll piss off you icky little pores, go get a job. The other issue is that understanding what's going on here requires the players having knowledge of the sixth world, like knowing that most of the four gangs here are vicious rivals or who the person is that's inside the limo. There's kind of an interesting storyline under all the chaos of the adventure, but I don't see any way for new players to actually experience it unless they're already Shadowrun fans. Worst of all, it's not really Shadowrun. I mean, Food Fight mostly isn't either, but at least it reinforces the chaotic and dangerous nature of the streets. But... In this, there's no meet with the Johnson, there's no negotiating the job, there's no planning the heist, there's no paranoia betrayal and hoping you get what was promised. The introductory adventure to Shadowrun isn't a Shadowrun. Again, the adventure is good, it is fine, there is nothing wrong with it except that it's the only adventure included with the beginner box. If you're a new Shadowrun player, first off, congratulations for making it this far in the video without getting completely lost. Second, if you're looking for a good introductory adventure to Shadowrun, there are plenty of resources out there, including the old published adventures, the Shadowrun missions, and a lot of free adventures published over the 30-year history of the game. With the NPCs that are included in the beginner box, you should be able to easily drop them in and run it mostly as is. There's enough variation the NPCs can sub in for Corpse Sec or Knight Errant, or you can just create your own adventure. The gangers have stolen a thingy without realizing how dangerous it is, now go and get it. Or the gangers have kidnapped someone important, but they're not being told who, and you're hired to go rescue that person. The tools are here to put together a more Shadowrun feeling adventure. And I think that shortcoming of this adventure becomes probably the biggest letdown of the beginner box overall, because I think I at least have gotten spoiled by beginner boxes from other games. Because this really has no replay value. There's no rules for character advancement. There's no gear that the characters don't already have. I mean, it won't be so bad starting in the fall of 2019 if you're watching this long after it was posted. But right now, the beginner box isn't due out until sometime in June, with the core rulebook not here until August. Which means we're looking at six weeks to two months of just the beginner box for our 6th edition rules. 
again, this may just be me being spoiled by other starter sets and beginner boxes having content for several weeks worth of play before deciding to shift over to the full version, but I really wish there was a bit more to carry us for new players to enjoy before jumping full in on Shadowrun. Okay, so I may have closed this on my least favorite part of the box set, which kind of making me seem down on it, but I'm really not. The set is worth every penny, and from what we get to see of the 6th edition rules, I'm chomping at the bit to get my hands on the full version. The edge system in my brief testing works well to push players to do more than just stand in the open and fire during combat, and with probably a bit more guidance from the full rules, we'll add a lot more layers to non-combat encounters by making them feel slightly tactical as well. I mean, imagine the verbal judo a good face player can get into to get edge while running like a leverage style con. The rules are well written and presented in a way that's easy to understand. Unlike a lot of other quick starts, you don't have to flip around the rule book to understand what's going on as things just fall into place as you go. The components are all really sturdily made, the quality is through the roof. Unless you're intentionally violent with the booklets like throwing them around a lot or spilling drinks on them, they're going to last a lot longer than most staple booklets included in sets like these. All in all, it makes me very happy and I can't wait to see what's coming in the future of the Sixth World. This is my day of the day, my first day of the day, this the way that I'm supposed to die. Oh